Hello and welcome. This video is part of a massive collaboration known as Paleo Rewind, a series made by another fellow dinosaur YouTuber known as Edge. For those of you that may not know, this is a project where several dinosaur YouTubers look at all of the cool things in regards to paleontology that happened within the year it's taking place. As you can see, the series is back for yet another episode, this time for all of the new discoveries made within 2021. Each one of us have selected a specific part of a specific month where we talk about said discoveries within that specific part. And I have the the second half of October. However, if you're familiar with the kind of content I cover, then you'll know I'm more into covering paleo media than paleo discoveries. That being said, before we get into the more paleontological discoveries made this month, I want to first talk about a specific controversy that happened in late October of 2021 that I would otherwise not mention at all if it didn't involve our good old friend Jack Horner. Ben from Benji Thomas did a great job covering all of the things from the first half of October, but that's not where it ends for paleontology this month. The second part of October also had some notable moments in paleontology, so without further ado, let's continue Paleo Rewind with a rather different topic for this series that involves everyone's favorite paleontologist, Jack Horner. So in October of 2021, Jack Horner caught himself in some more controversy. For those of you that don't know, Jack Horner is a very prolific, no, that's not the word. What is it? It's a, a very respectable, nope, wait, hold up. That's not the word either. Um, Man, I, I don't know. What is it? Jesus, it's at, the, it's at the tip of my tongue. Infamous, that's the word I'm looking for. He's a very infamous paleontologist in the community. All jokes aside, Horner is no stranger to controversy as he's had some pretty rough takes on dinosaurs in the past. But this recent controversy doesn't have much to do with the dinosaurs themselves, but rather his latest project that he decided to use them for. This project was an attempt to sell a collection of paleo art to people, but not like the cool hand-drawn stuff you'd see in books, no. Jack Horner decided to instead create dinosaur NFTs that he would then sell for a bunch of money, because that's a thing right now. That's right, for those of you who didn't know, Jack Horner, you know, the guy who was brought on as a consultant for the first Jurassic Park movie, is trying his hand with NFTs now. And I think that's pretty funny. Now when he announced this to his Twitter on October 16th of this year, you could probably guess what the reactions were. People were not too happy about this because for those of you that don't know, NFTs are a very debated topic right now. Because I don't want this whole segment to be solely based on what NFTs are, I'm going to give a brief definition of it and why people don't like it. NFT stands for non-fungible tokens, which are interchangeable units of data on a blockchain, which makes it so it can be sold, traded, and owned on digital markets using cryptocurrency. NFTs are known to sell for ridiculous amounts of money because these works of digital arts, gifts, and even videos can sell for literally thousands and sometimes even millions of dollars. So why are people mad about this besides the absurd prices? Well, the blockchain that's typically used for NFTs is Ethereum and they use a lot of energy to run their network. So much so that they use just as much, if not more energy just to run these networks as a small country uses within a yearly period. And as you probably already guessed, that increases greenhouse gases, making it very bad for the environment. And again, a paleontologist, a man who studies extinct animals is participating in a trend that is bad for the environment environment. Kind of ironic, which I think is what makes it funny, but I do have to say, some of his artwork isn't that bad in terms of looks. I still wouldn't buy them because, I mean, look at those prices. Horner had apparently collaborated with paleo artist Fabio Pastori, which if you don't know him, you'll surely know his works, as he has a very distinct art style, especially when it comes to his works in prehistoric life. While I can't say I 100% agree with how he's distributing this art, I can't say it's bad by any means. I mean, don't get me wrong, it's definitely quality work, just not thousands of dollars and leaving me broke in the streets quality work. And that's the other thing about NFTs that a lot of people seem to have an issue with, and that's the fact that you don't even truly own it. Because the buyer doesn't receive any real copyright privileges and the original creator can still distribute it and make more work like it. From what I can gather, people who buy this stuff don't buy the actual product, but rather they buy the proof that they purchased the product. Or as some would simply call a receipt. You are essentially buying buying a receipt that says you paid for something. Man, I bet you didn't think you'd be learning about NFTs and why people hate them in a Paleo Rewind video, but 
here we are. Anyways, Jack Horner has a whole collection of these NFTs that he titled Jack Horner's Dinosaurs, The Origin Collection. In this collection, he portrays the dinosaurs with very unique coloring, different behavioral elements, and has even made animations for some of them. There are several dinosaurs within this collection, including Myasaura, Pachycephalosaurus, Troodon, and T-Rex Scavenger. The most notable one is definitely this T-Rex, which has been fitted with a chicken-like comb for some reason. Honestly, still looks pretty cool in my opinion. All right, that's enough of that. I know this isn't what you normally see here on Paleo Rewind, but it's always nice to catch up on our good old friend Jack Horner and see what he's been up to lately. But I know what you guys are here for. You're here for the actual paleontology stuff, you know, the discoveries and news on dinosaur fossils and whatnot. So let's get into that. Along with the Jack Horner controversy, another very notable event happened during this time that involved a rather pressing matter in the world of paleontology. And it's one that I've talked about before on my own channel, and that is the idea of auctioning off dinosaur fossils. On October 21st of this year, a Triceratops skeleton that's known as Big John would sell for around $7.7 .7 million in an auction in Paris. For those of you that don't know, Big John is a fossilized Triceratops skeleton that was discovered in 2014 by paleontologist Walt Walter W. Stein from the Hell Creek Formation, and he was named after the owner of the land in which he was discovered in. What makes him a notable specimen is his overall size. The skeleton is 9 feet tall and 26 feet long, which makes him anywhere from between 5 to 10% bigger than any other Triceratops specimen that has ever been discovered, setting the record for being the largest known Triceratops skeleton. However, this isn't the only record he set, as he's also said to be the most expensive Triceratops as well, as he was eventually sold to an anonymous US collector in late October, who purchased him for a total of 6.6 6 million euros, which converts to 7.7 .7 million dollars. This obviously brings up a pretty concerning dilemma for paleontologists, as some have stated that along with these specimens already being taken away from the hands of those who've dedicated their lives to studying and preserving these discoveries, the purchase of something like this at the price it managed to exceed would only continue to expand the market and demand for dinosaur fossils. This in turn could lead to people looting dig sites of specimens that could be useful for the world of paleontology that will unfortunately go through a process that will make it so they just end up in the possession of someone with a lot of money. What's worse is that this high demand will only increase the dinosaur fossil's value and make them even more expensive, making it much harder for museums to get their hands on it. And in turn, researchers and scientists won't be able to properly study or preserve the fossil, and these kinds of situations are unfortunately common. In a paper written by paleontologist Dr. Roy Smith, he talks about how baby pterosaurs from much larger species actually outcompeted the adults from smaller species. Large pterosaurs were very common in the late Cretaceous period, and those that were classified as larger pterosaurs had a wingspan ranging from 2 meters to over 6 meters in length. Small to medium pterosaurs were known to reach less than 1 meter to 2 meter wingspans, and the much smaller pterosaurs reached to less than 1 meter wingspans. Initially, it was thought that newly evolved Evolved birds were overtaking the smaller pterosaurs in the skies, but newer studies show that it was actually the babies of larger pterosaurs that were doing that. The examples that were studied were the small pterosaurs from the mid Cretaceous Chem Chem group of Morocco, where a total of over 400 pterosaur specimens have been discovered in that area. Examining the jaws of some of the specimens, both large and small, said a lot about both the pterosaurs themselves and their feeding ecology. Further research of the fossils within this group showed scientists that the feeding ecology of large pterosaurs were more similar to that of crocodiles rather than actual birds. In a modern riverbank environment like the Nile, you'd be able to spot several species of birds within the area, all different shapes and sizes hunting for prey that's only slightly different from each other. But then you take something like crocodiles and it's a completely different story. They're less diverse and what they feed on is dependent on their stage of life. Young crocodiles are known to feed on smaller, easier prey such as insects, but as they get older they will move on to smaller mammals and fish. And finally, when they're full grown, they will eventually take down a full on zebra. And it's thought that pterosaurs feeding ecology functioned the same way where in each stage of their life, they'd focus on a different form of prey that they were capable of taking down and eating. 
Once they reached the final boss of that stage, they would be able to continue on the game of life and eat different forms of prey until they eventually reached a high enough level to attempt the next boss fight. Don't be like that guy. Anyways, thank you all for watching my segment here on Paleo Rewind, but now it's time to move on to November, which is covered by Dane Pavitt. Thank you guys so much for watching, and a huge thank you to Edge for inviting me on to Paleo Rewind. This was an amazing opportunity, and even though I decided to be a little different with my topics, I hope you guys enjoyed my segment nonetheless. Make sure to tune back in on January 1st so you can watch the entire series that will be uploaded as one massive video on Edge's channel. I'll be sure to link his channel in the description down below and the main video when it comes out. Thank you all again for watching, and have a nice day.